Now we want to take the Nears to Mamalapuram, which they are already familiar with. It has now been over 300 years since Mahendra Palavar and Mamala Narasimha made this Dharamugapatnam a dream come true with their marvelous sculptures. The appearance of the city is somewhat faded. Change does not make us happy. The lofts are crumbling and dilapidated. The streets and harbors are not as crowded as before. Trade growth is not so much. There are no major trade routes. All the streets are not piled up with mountains of export and import goods. We have seen before that the sea entered the earth and formed a deep channel, which was a natural harbor for ships to come and rest safely. Now the canal has been eroded by sand and the depth has decreased. Only small boats and boats can enter the shallow waters. Boats and trees should stand at some distance in the sea. Boats should be loaded with trade goods and added to the timber. It should be mentioned that Mamalapuram has achieved some new features during the above-mentioned period. Mainly the beautiful stone temple on the beach attracts our eyes and opinion. It is not like the hilltop temples built during the Mahendran Mamalan period. The temple was built by bringing stones from the hills. It looks like a beautiful crown of jewels placed on the head of Samadra Raja. Damn! What is the beauty of the temple system? Apart from this, the Vinakara temple where the three world-sized Purimal reclines in the middle of the city is also a sight to see. It was the work done by Parmswara Pallava, who raised Saivism and Vyashnavism as two eyes. Thirumangayas war came to this temple and visited Thalassayana Purimal and sang Tamil songs that overflowed with devotion. The sun had set on the Pallava Empire in the century after the reign of Thirumangaya war. The excellence of Kanchi, unequalled in education has also diminished. The commercial viability of the cell-powered sea urchin also declined. But there is no shortage of amazing sculptures of that immortal city which is to give eternal fame to Tamil Nadu. The strange pictorial sculptures carved into the rock walls and the Vimanaraths carved into the hills are as fresh today as they were when they were erected 300 years ago. There were more people who came to admire the sculptural treasures than the traders who came to export goods. Through the streets of Mamalapurat a beautiful Vimana chariot was driven by two horses. The ornaments of the horses, the carvings of the chariot, and the gold-plated canopy of the chariot, which shone like another sun in the evening sun, indicated that the occupants must have belonged to the royal family. Yes, three royals were sitting in the spacious interior of that golden chariot. One of them was Adathakari Kalan, the heroic warrior and eldest son of Sundara Chola. At a very young age, he went to the battlefield and performed heroic deeds. Killed Virapandian of Madurai in the final battle and earned the title Virapandian headed Gopareksari. Soon after Virapandian reached the heroic heaven and the Pandian country came under the Chola Empire, Sundarakalar fell ill. Aditha Kari Kalan himself was the one who deserved the next title, and Uvarajya gave him Patabi Shekham. Aditha Kari Kalan also got the right to engrave his name on the first inscriptions. Later, Aditha Kari Kalan travelled to Vedanadu in order to completely free the throat Mandal from the domination of the dual Mandal Khanera god. He performed heroic deeds there and on many battlefields. He chased the forces of the twin zones to the north of Vedapana. It was also necessary to increase the strength of the army to invade the north. So he stayed at Kanchi and began to raise an army and collect the necessary armaments and logistics for the invasion. At this stage, the detractors started obstructing his efforts. They said that the northern invasion could start only after the Sri Lankan war was over. More and more rumours started floating in the air. It was learned that the army that had gone to fight in Sri Lanka had not received the food it needed from the Chola country. About 300 years before and after the time of our story, heroic sons were appearing in the womb of the Tamil mother, including the great heroes we read about in the epics. Warriors like Viman, Arkuna, Bhishma, Drona, Kadojajan, and Abhamenu incarnated in Tamil Nadu. They performed feats that made the world wonder. Each victory in the war brought more pain to their shoulders. Old men had the strength to move the mountain. Intrepid youths had the power to soar into the air, reach the sky's crest, and shoot down the stars. Two such warriors were sitting on the same seat with Aditha Kari Kalan in the chariot in which he was riding. One of them was Thirukovalar Malay Aman. 
The name was shortened to Maladu and Malaju in the Malaya Manadu custom of his rule. Hence he got the title of Malajadiar. Vanamadavi, the second daughter of Sundara Chola Emperor, was his wealthy daughter. Therefore, he was the father of Aditha Kari Kalan. He resembled Bhishma, the master of the Kauravas, in maturity and wisdom. Although Aditha Kari Kalan had great devotion to him, his wisdom sometimes tested the patience of the heroic prince. Parthipendra was another one of those in the chariot. He sprang from the old Pallavar clan in one of the branch lines. Aditya is slightly older than Kari Kalan. Due to his lack of state power, he wanted to show his prowess on the battlefield and establish his heroic fame. Aditha reached Kari Kalan. He helped Aditha Kari Kalan by acting as his right hand in the battle with Veera Pandaya. Thus Aditha became the intimate friend of Kari Kalan. The two became CO Pri 8 comrades from the day Veera Pandian fell. As these three rode in the chariot they were talking about the news that had arrived from Tanjavur as barbarians. I cannot tolerate the arrogance of these traitors for a moment. Day by day they are crossing the line. How arrogant must they be to accuse my messenger of oneness? They promised a reward of a thousand gold to those who capture him? How can I bear all this? My sheathed sword has bowed in shame. You preach patience. Said Aditha Kari Gallan. I did not preach patience. But I only said then that Vandiyadeva should not be sent on such an important matter. I knew that the troublemaker would spoil the matter. Is it enough if he only knows how to throw a sword and throw a job? He who goes on a royal mission must have intelligence. He said. Parthipendra. Prince Karakalan's admiration for Vandiyadeva is not appreciated by Parthibendra. He always complains about him. He finds fault in anything he does. So on this occasion also he accused the same. Have you started your story? You will not be entertained if you don't have something to say about Vandiyadeva. If he doesn't have intelligence, who else has? Somehow, somehow, he has carried out my order to deliver the leaf to the emperor in person. So the pundits are angry. What is Vandiyadeva's fault in this? Asked Aditha Kari Gallan. He would not have stood by what you sent him. He would have interfered in other undesirable matters. Said Parthipendra. Shut up. Grandfather. Why are you so silent? What do they think? What if a huge army was gathered and the emperor was brought back from Tanjavur to Kanchi? How many days do we have to watch the emperor being kept as if he were in prison by the evildoers? How many days do we spend in fear of the evildoers? Aditha Kari Gallan roared. Having seen sixty-six battlefields in his lifetime, Thirukovalar Malayaman, Malajadiar, cleared his throat to reply. By this time the waves of the sea could be seen opposite, and he said, Let us first get off this chariot, brother. Let us go and sit in the usual place and talk. Am I not old? It is not easy to talk in a moving chariot.